Good morning. Let's get started. We are really pleased to have Muriel Medard as our uh, CS Nexus joint seminar speaker today. She is Cecil Green Professor of EECS Department at Massachusetts Institute of Technology. She has had former positions at the MIT Lincoln Labs and at the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. All of her degrees are from MIT. Not one, not two, but three BS degrees, an MS degree, and a PhD. She's a well-known researcher in the field of network coding and reliable communications. She served on the editorial boards of many journals. She served as the president of the IEEE Information Theory Society. She received many awards from the IEEE, ACM, and MIT. Today's talk is on a new look at the basics of information theory, a field founded by three papers by Claude Shannon in the late 1940s and is the basis of the information age we live in today. Let's give a warm welcome to our speaker. Very much. Uh, I was uh, really thrilled to get an invitation. And uh, before you think, yes, I know how cold it is in Boston, that was not the only reason. Uh, it's also because. Um, love all my colleagues here and uh, it was r the right time I had something that I was super excited uh, to tell people about and, uh, and that's uh, what I'm gonna do what I'm gonna do today so uh, thank you all for the invitation and also um, to the rest of you for coming all right so I'm gonna talk today as you just heard about reliable communications over noisy channels which is you know the, the, the bread and butter of, of information theory and, and really something which seems so well established uh, that it's, uh, it's either presumptuous or just plain old idiotic to go ahead and, and revisit it. So that's what we're going to do today. I'm not presumptuous, so you figure out which of the two that is. Um, we're calling it guessing random additive noise decoding because it's exactly what we're going to be doing. And of course, it has the added benefit of having the, a, a, a very nice um, uh, of, of coming out as grand. Uh, and uh, my, my co-author, Ken Duffy, is from Ireland. I don't know if anybody has ever been to Ireland. Do you know how they always say everything is grand? Like it doesn't matter what it is, you know, they may be dying, they may be very happy, you ask them how they are and they always say, oh, I'm grand. Uh, and so, you know, everything is grand, it's sort of, it has, it has no meaning whatsoever. Uh, so it was, uh, um, it, it was uh, a good name for this. Okay, so I'm not going to assume that you know any information theory whatsoever or any coding theory, but I'm hoping to make the, the talk quite accessible to, to people who just have a, a general, say, CS or electrical engineering background. But at the same time, I'm hoping also to interest those of you who are you know, experts in the area, <laughs> such as some of the people in the, in the audience. So what do we mean by coding? Well, really what we mean by coding is sort of two different things that you do to data. The first thing is you have your data, and you first squish it, okay? Because you know you use gzip or you use some other source, uh, uh, what we call source coding or compression, uh, because there is some inherent redundancy which is not useful for the description. So you have an image, you can make it smaller. You have a file, you can make it smaller. And then lots and lots and lots of algorithms to do this. So you know whether you're thinking of H.264, or I mentioned GZ before, et cetera, et cetera. That's basically what they're doing. They're getting rid of redundancy, which doesn't really um, uh, help in terms of reconstructing the data. OK. Uh, then you have to send the data. And generally, there are issues uh, over the medium that you want to send the data. There's electromagnetic noise. There's interference from uh, other people trying to access the same channel. There are all kinds of things that go wrong in the transmission. And that's what we generally call channel coding. To do channel coding, what you do is you take the data that you just squished and you stretch it back out by adding some redundancy, which is going to be extra information which will allow you to, reconst to, to reconstruct the data in a reliable fashion. You then transmit over the channel. Some of the data is corrupted in some way. We'll see later <coughs> what kind of ways. We're going to choose very, very simple models for standard simple models of how this um, corruption of the data occurs. And then you basically get back to that short description may have been the, the, the gzip that, that you sent uh, your friend with, uh, with some files. And then, of course, you unzip it and you get back 
what happened. Okay, so this is, if you will, like the you know the Krebs cycle of data. Okay, that's 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 what we do. All right, and in particular, we're going to be looking at this part here, and it's this part in general that has been hard and has really been creating all the problems for this part because whatever you code, you have to decode. Now here, this is invertible generally because you know th th there was no corruption. Here, the uncertainty that comes from the corruption in the, in the channel is going to make the decoding tricky. So generally what we're doing is we're trying to encode so that you can decode in a way that is simple and still sufficiently efficient in ways which will make clear in the rest of the talk. OK. <coughs> so what does it mean, therefore, to do this encoding and decoding? I tell you a message, OK? I tell you a message. I tell you a string of eight characters, eight bits. And for whatever reason, because you know there was noise from next door, one of the bits flips. OK? So that's for the rest of the talk, let's just think of bits flipping. It's either good or bad until the very end of the talk when we'll revisit that. Okay? Uh, so you hear something else. And of course, you map it to a different, to a different, uh, uh, a different message. That's not right. So what do we do? So if it could have been that any eight bits that I could have told you were possible messages, we're done. There's nothing to be done. You, you got the wrong message. And you know there's no, no correction possible. So there has to be some constraint. Again, a lot of CS people think of a hash, a hash in effect that you can check and see whether this was correct or not. But not just a hash necessarily just to check if it was correct or not, but maybe something beyond a hash, a hash that will also allow you not only to detect that there was something wrong, but to reconstruct what was the most likely thing that I did send. Okay? All right. So how do we do that? So this idea of this you know, hash plus that I just described, that's what's a code book. Uh, so basically what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to give up some of the possibilities of what I could have sent to you. I may not be able to send all two to the eight possibilities to you. I'm going to give up some of that richness of communication, what we call the rate, in order to enhance the reliability to these possible bit flips or corruptions that occur. OK. And this is going back <laughs> to my very kind introduction of Professor Ellen from at end of here, uh, Sue so Shannon's 1948 channel coding theorem. How dense does my code book get to be? You know, how rich is the set of messages that I can send to you uh, so that it's very unlikely that I end up with the wrong transmission to you? Now, of course, today, in this example, suppose that all the bits could flip. Well, you know, I mean, if anything can happen, there's just nothing I can send to you reliably, right? Intuitively, we realize that. But if somehow it's, you know, fairly likely that one would flip, but rather unlikely that two would flip, super unlikely that three would flip, and so on and so forth, we should be able to do something. Okay, and that's exactly what we're going to be exploring. So practical coding is a construction of these code books, basically these descriptions with these very clever hashes, and computationally efficient mechanisms of decoding. Checking a hash is always easy. You know, just checking whether it was an error or not. But now from that hash, reconstructing what the possible error patterns have been so that I can correct what was transmitted, what, what, what I received, to recover what was transmitted, that's hard. That's basically, if you will, what all of coding theory is based on. All right. So how do we do this? Well, if I did not coding, so for instance, if n in my previous example was 8, I have 2 to the 8 possibilities. And the rate is going to be somewhat smaller. The rate, again, the richness of the messages I can send to you. And my rate I'm going to call r. So r is somewhere between 1 if I had, for instance, no errors that ever happened. I could always get to that. And zero, which is I didn't transmit something. Okay? And in 1948, Shannon identified the maximum rate at which communication could take place. If one knew the statistical properties of the noise, I mean, if you have really no clue what the noise is going to do to you, we all agree intuitively it's going to be really hard to determine what we can do reliably. Because as we mentioned, if the noise could change any of the bits, say, with high likelihood, then how are we ever, ever going to agree 
on, a, um, on what was transmitted. And what he said is, okay, give me the statistical properties of the noise. Let me look at the entropy H of the noise. Okay, this is the, the normal entropy, the entropy that we use in you know, um, thermodynamics, you know, minus P log P minus 1 minus P log 1 minus P. Okay? Uh, we'll see other entropies later, which is why I'm, I'm mentioning this. And he said, basically, you can get up to this rate, as, which is 1, which would have been with no noise, minus H, which is the entropy of the noise. And I can show you how to get to that rate. We'll talk about that in a minute. And, lay, and Fano separately showed, by the way, you cannot do better than that. You know, if you do better than that, it means that you're going to have an error. By the way, we're also going to revisit that. Okay? All right. So this is what we know. And what was his argument? Well, his argument was the following. And it's a you know, beautifully, beautifully uh, elegant argument, which is, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take uh, a large n, not 8, something larger. I'm going to pick you know, 2 to the nr messages. That's how many I can send. That's the, the richness of the message set that I can send to you. We agree? That's what it means to have this rate. Um, and the way I'm going to build a code book is out of the 2 to the n possibilities, I am going to randomly, uniformly assign from my 2 to the nr possible messages code words out of the 2 to the n possible code words. OK? With replacement. So I could do really stupid things, like you know, assign, have two messages with the same code word, which obviously is going to give me an error. So really, really simple. So you can see from what I just said, or the fact that it's with replacement, there's going to be a sparsity argument that kicks in here. This is a sparsity argument, that somehow the code, the code words are sparse relative to all the possibilities of strings that would be out there. That's going to be my argument. OK. So my code book, C. And then <coughs> remember what I showed you, I have to decode. So I send this over my channel, something happens, and I have a statistical description of the noise, of the deleterious effect of the channel, which I'm going to be uh, representing by this P, which is the probability, what we call the transition probability. C is the code word that I put in. Y is the output. I am going to look at, in effect, what we call maximum likelihood. But it's really a maximum a posteriori. <laughs> but because we assume always that all of the code words have equal likelihood, I'm going to use maximum likelihood and, ma and uh, maximum a posteriori interchangeably. Okay. Uh, I'm going to determine the maximum likely input, given the noise model, as being, let me look at what I received. Let me then inspect all of the code words. Of course, it has to be that the sender and the receiver are both aware of the code book in this setting. Okay? Let me look at all of the possible code words, and let me pick the one that maximizes that, the argmax. Okay? Given what I saw, you know, so I have, I have y. <coughs> I'm going to pick the c that conditionally maximizes that. Make sense? What's the most likely input, given what I saw? I mean, that, that's basically what you would do. Now, this is fine, but you can imagine that, of course, my n is large. I'd like my r to be as large as possible. So this code book is big. And it's going to be really hard for me to search through that code book unless there's some structure in it. That is the whole field of coding theory. I'm going to sneak in enough structure in it that that decoding is not too hard. <coughs> but as soon as I sneak in structure, because I'm not doing what the coding theorem told me to do, I am giving up some rate. And so it's that tension between sticking in structure to make my life easier, right, and giving up rate because I'm not doing what the coding theorem told me to do. That you know, really makes coded, <coughs> uh, coding interesting. What people talk about what we call modern codes, things like LDBCs and turbos, basically the idea is that you're really in sort of a pseudo-random type of environment. I'll talk about that in a second. Okay. 
So why is this not done? As I just mentioned, there's so many possibilities. So even if I have 1,024 bits, which is not a very long code, it's a longish, but certainly not very long code, very, very reasonable relative to what's out there. And if I had a large rate, then basically it would be very, very difficult for me to check, right? I have storage complexity, 10 to uh, 227. I have computation complexity. You know, of course, you can always trade storage for computation with lookup tables, but basically it's nasty. There's, there's, there's nothing nice that I, that I can do if I have to do an exhaustive search. Okay, as I just mentioned, and by the way, this is just a view of coding. It's, it's an opinion, but it's, you know, that we can discuss it. And forgiveness for, for again, asking from all, all the specialists in the area who may, you know, everybody has their own view, but I think it's, it's pretty reasonable. Most people would say, you have an effect, I'm going to call them generally, you know, algebraic codes, whether they're block codes or whether they're convolutional codes, it's basically the same thing. Convolutional codes are still algebraic codes, they're just over, uh, over polynomials, okay, versus not over polynomials. <coughs> Uh, modern codes that I mentioned, uh, like low density packages and turbo codes. By the way, you know, I always laugh when people say, oh, you know, all these new great uh, advances like LDPCs. I'm like, LDPCs, you know, they were done by my advisor, Bob Gallagher, way before I was born. Okay, so <laughs> let's just leave it at that. That's not, all right. Um, uh, and uh, rateless codes basically just have some refinements. All of these are end to end network codes over an entire network. Uh, you can use, there's a connection between the compression that I talked to you about and the expansion, right? I'm not going to go much into that, but there is a connection. They're basically duals of each other. Remember how I first squished the data and then stretched it out? Okay, you can actually do that. The reason there's a connection, which I'm going to allude to again, <coughs> is that when you compress a, when you compress a source, if you know the statistics, you can uh, compress it to its entropy. So what we had here in this formula, what we had here in this formula, it's one minus the description of the noise. Does that make sense? The compressed description of the noise. So if I had just given you the noise and asked you to compress it, you could have compressed it to its entropy. So what do we have? I have basically a bunch of bits, and I'm going to have to allocate some of those bits to my message, and the rest of the bits go to the noise. I have two to the n bits. The noise is going to take up two to the n h to describe. I have to describe the noise if it's going to be additive, because once I have y and I know c, I know, I know, I know the noise. Right? So if you, give, if you give me the output, telling me the noise or telling me the code word is exactly the same thing. Does that make sense? We're going to be using that, OK? So this idea that you can take, that you can take channel coding and sort of run it backwards to do compression is actually very much in line with the fact that that's what the capacity is telling you. So it's, you know, your budget of bits, which is 2 to the, two to the n possibilities. 2 to the n to the r is given to the message. 2 to the n h is given to the noise. All right? Very good. OK. So um, 2009, Polar Codes, uh, discovered by Eric Kahn. I'm going to be mentioning his name multiple times in, in, in my talk. Uh, by the way, it showed that you could do this with, with small block sizes. I'm not going to go into how, but I'll revisit that later in the talk. And by the way, this idea of decoding and how difficult decoding is, is something that's constantly, constantly, uh, in, uh, uh, not just in academia, but also in practice. Um, and even for capacity achieving codes like polar codes, by the way, they are now in the 5G standard for the control channel. Uh, so they were very quickly going, they very quickly went from theory to practice. And you know, um, Alex Vardy, as you were talking about him right before, uh, you know, a Alex Vardy has um, just, just uh, did some uh, work that was, uh, that was licensed uh, uh, by Samsung for, for decoding polar codes, okay, uh, which were invented by Bertel Uh There are many other things, by the way. I just want to allude to them because I'm going to come back to this at the end of my lecture. There are many other things that are going on, 
Okay, so when I say, you know, bit flips, everybody's like, well, you know, bit flipping, I can understand, it's pretty, it's pretty straightforward. You know, these channels are a mess, okay, they're not just bit flipping. You know, here's a very simple, uh, very simple bit of frequency um, uh, trace, okay. Basically, they don't just occur uniformly, but one of the things that people do is actually, because the decoding is so difficult, if you're on top of everything else, had to take into account the details of the statistics of the noise, when I talk about age of the noise, it would be very difficult. And so actually what people do is they interleave, they mix it up so that the noise looks, you know, as, uh, <clears throat> as memorless as possible. Okay, so there's a lot going on that I'm just sweeping under the rug. I'm just showing you these wiggly things to make you aware of that it's a mess. Okay, so grant. So remember that I mentioned that it's the same thing for me to be looking at the noise as it is for me to be, so we think of, you know, remember that max, that arc max, max over all i of y given ci, okay? Now, it, once you told me the c, you told me the noise. So what I'm gonna suggest to you is why don't we look at the noise directly? Now, I understand you don't want to decode the noise because, you know, you didn't care about the noise. You cared about C, but never mind C, okay? What I'm going to do is in this ML slash map decoding, I am going to try to guess the noise rather than trying to, and from the guessing the noise, tell you what the code word was, the most likely code word, rather than starting from this huge code book. Now, why do I want to do this? Most modern systems, you want a high rate. If your rate is not high enough, what you do is you change the way you're using your channel modulation, etc., so that you get to a lower bit error rate, a lower bit flip. So we don't generally operate channels, except there's always corner cases, so I'm talking in generality, but certainly over almost all commercial channels. We operate them in regimes where those bit flips are very small. So remember the one minus h, r, we want it to be big because I want to send you a lot. So two to the n r is super big. And now I'm having to search over two to the n r code words to do this maximum likelihood map decoding. And because that's such a pain, I don't do it. I give up some other rate in order to reduce my complexity by using, you know, this variety of rich, complicated, and, you know, highly sophisticated techniques. All right? But now I'm going to say, no, no, no. Okay, your rate was, when your rate is big, it means that your h had to be small. So why don't I go and guess the 2 to the nh? Maybe that's not so big. And of course, if I come and I guess the right noise, remember that I told you the first thing that a code is, is a hash. The first thing that a code should be able to do is to tell me, is this correct or not? And then it tells me some other stuff as to how to correct it if it was not. But the first thing it does is it provides me a hash, it provides me a certificate of whether this was correct or not. Now, of course, the certificate might be wrong. We'll see that in a minute. Right? I could tell you that, yes, this is a correct code word. I told you that it is a correct code word. I was not able to tell you if it was actually the code word that was sent. But once I guess the most correct code word, I'm done. That is maximum likelihood. That's the best that I can do. That's what Shannon was getting at. I cannot do better than maximum likelihood slash maximum posterior. Does everybody understand? OK, great. OK. So where do I go with this? So if I have high rates and my block sizes are not very long, which again is what everybody is trying to shoot for. So the reason, you know, the many reasons, but the reason polar codes was included so quickly into the 5G standard for the control channel is because, you know, we're talking about short codes, 128 or so, 120 bits, okay? So what we want is high rates with small block sizes, low complexity, when my R is large. Now, how am I going to do this? Well, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at the Y, 
And I'm not even going to consider what the code book is. Again, it sounds insane. What do you mean you're decoding without the code book? I don't care about the code book. I care about the nodes. Okay? So I look at the Y, and I'm going to guess my most likely noise. I have a statistical description of the noise. I always did. That's how I was designing my communications channel. Inherent in the decoding of maximum likelihood was this transition probability, if you recall. Right? That transition probability, I had it to do the maximum likelihood. So I have this transition probability. So I'm just going to guess, and then I'm going to give it to a checker, which is in effect something that's just going to compute the hash that's inherent in my code word, and I'm going to ask, is this a code word? And if my checker says yes, done. That was a maximum likelihood. If it, does, if it says no, I go to the second most likely noise and ask it, is this correct? And so on and so forth. And basically, you can see that this will give you the maximum likelihood. Now, I have a race here. I have a race between guessing the true noise and guessing an equivalent noise, what we're going to call what we're going to call an inter-code word noise, which would be the noise that corresponds to making me jump to another code word. Now remember how the coding theorem worked. I sprinkled uniformly over my possible 2 to the nr code words. I sprinkled uniformly 2 to the nr messages. Yes? So I'm just sprinkling them. So there is, there is a, a noise that takes me from one code word to another. But that noise, I know the distribution of it. Why do I know the distribution of it? Because it's just the difference between these uniformly sprinkled code, code words. Yeah? OK. So the fact that these code words have been chosen randomly, uniformly, with a density, basically, it means that I really only care about the density, which is r over my possible 1. OK? So 1 over r is my density. So I'm going to determine the complexity in the exponential sense, the so complexity of the amount decoding by noise guessing. And one of the funny things is, remember how I'm sprinkling my code words? If my code book becomes higher in density, if my r goes up, then I'm done faster. Because either I guess correctly or I guess the incorrect thing. Now, that, that makes sense. That was what maximum likelihood did. But for all of you who are in decoding, reason we often are working with code rates that are much lower than capacity is because the computational difficulty, and I'll mention that later again uh, when, I look, when we look at some curves, usually goes up like crazy exponentially as my rate goes up. So if, and we'll, we'll see later why that is, OK? But keep that in mind as we go ahead. All right. Maximum likelihood decoding, as I just mentioned before, <coughs> what happens is I receive the Y, transmitted code word plus noise. I compute a posteriori, remember that max arg, all the problems of all the code words. That would take me two to the end of computations. You know, it's complexity. So whether it's space complexity we look up or computational complexity, whatever you want, you know, it's the complexity there is. But by the way, you know, since most of you are CS people, you understand you can do this with a tree, right? So the checking is not complex, even if it's random, right? The checking is linear, because you're just going along a tree, right? If I give you, a, if I give you an, an element of the code book and I ask you if it's a code book or not, you can check pertinence to the tree in linear time, OK? The reviewers were confused about this one. <laughs> I was like, no, 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 no. You put it in a tree, OK? Things are, things are in a tree. But you guys are CS people. I don't need to tell you that. OK, so the maximum likelihood to go to code word is the highest a posterior probability. OK, so remember, out of 2 to the n possible code words, the code book has 2 to the n r. ML decoding, I know, is capacity achieving, OK? But it has this, possibility, this probability, this uh, difficulty of a very high, um, very high um, Complex. OK? All right. Let's go back in time. You know, we were in the 40s. Let's fast forward to the 50s, OK? So if you fast forward to the 50s, remember how I showed you those convolutional codes and that, that sweep 
of, uh, of coding, okay? So people are looking at convolutional codes and go, oh, this, this is really well, but how do I decode it? And there were people, Elias, Fano, um, uh, Jacobs, and, uh, and many other people who were looking at, you know, how, how, how to do these things. Uh, and in particular, what they looked at is the following approach. I receive the transmitted code word plus noise. This is not specifically for uh, con uh, convolutional codes, but this is generally has been considered in the context of convolutional codes, okay? I receive the transmitted code word plus noise. I'm going to compute the apostrophe probabilities, and I'm going to guess according to an apostrophe probability order, and check the decoding in the transmitted code word, okay? And it turns out that if your code has a particular structure, a particular structure that sequence, that con uh, con convolutional codes have and concatenated codes use, okay? But uh, so both concatenated and convolutional codes do this. Um, then this gives me the transmitted code. You can see how this looks like a very small variation on what happened before, okay? Everybody happy that this, this would give you that? Okay, and now the question is, how hard is this to do? Well, there was a folk theorem, if you will, that you, when you're doing this and check sequentially for a class of codes called tree codes, it doesn't matter what tree codes are, let's just say that you know, I know how to make tree codes <coughs> and convolutional codes are tree codes. If I do this, in order to be able to do this checking with an average time complexity that is not excessive, I have to give up rate. And I have to give up rate to something which is 1 minus, instead of the entropy of the noise, something which is 1 minus half of the Rényi entropy, uh, entropy, uh, blah, blah, entropy of order 1 half of the noise, which is larger. So I have to reduce the rate. We, we'll, we're going to revisit Renyi in a minute. Okay? If you've never heard of Renyi, don't worry about it. You're not supposed to. Okay? If you have, good for you. So, but basically this is requiring those statistics. It's really just requiring confirmation. And like I said, it, it uh, goes approximately constant in, uh, in the time complexity up to the cutoff rate. This one minus the entropy of order, the Renyi entropy of order one half of the noise. Beyond that, beyond that, it just goes exponential, right? And this is something that was found in the 90s by Erdel Arakan, and it's very interesting because, you know, there was sort of a loss of interest in the 90s in these cutoff rates. Why turbo codes had come in 93, these pseudo-random things I talked to you about, which, you, by the way, you don't quite know when you're going to finish, but you sort of, you know, hope it goes well, and it always does. Uh, and then after, you know, people sort of discovered turbo codes, but by the way, there was a huge amount, huge amount of, uh, of uh, skepticism when they first came out, okay? When people discovered, re discovered turbo codes, they went ahead and rediscovered low-density parity codes and went, wait, those also you just decode kind of hoping for the best and it always seems to work out, right? The, so that's uh, for both of those. But basically, he, he showed this, and I would say that it went largely unnoticed because there was this interest in other kinds of codes, even though I think this is a major result. Okay. All right. So basically, you have this uh, this issue with the cutoff rate, uh, which in you know normal tree codes is one minus the entropy of the Arrhenius entropy of order one half of the noise. And if you read this beautiful paper that Erdogan wrote on the origin of polar coding in JSAC, um, uh, you know two three years ago, basically what he says is he was thinking of that result that I just mentioned. I was thinking of how to improve the cutoff rate for different kinds of codes in order to get to capacity. So that's basically what polar codes do. They start out with this decoding uh, approach, and they're basically trying to do something, that's what polarization does, to improve the cutoff rate. 
All right? Okay. So this is a sequential decoding with guessing. Now, the other thing that people do is they do something called nearest neighbor decoding, which is basically list the noise sequences in precinct having weight order. That is to say how many ones there are. Right? And the ones with more ones are less likely than the ones with fewer ones. And you, you basically list the noise sequences, you subtract the noise sequence, check if it's in the code book, return the first identified code book. So when the noise sequence is exactly BSC, and follows a Hamming weight, the BSC is the binary symmetric channel, the, unif the, I, the IID flipping of bits with some probability. <coughs> okay? This works. This gives you a mal decoding. Sometimes this is hard, sometimes this is easy. Okay? We'll see later that we are not going to require that. Okay? But the code words here are designed to have a large minimum Hamming distance. So all of the code word construction based on distance, all of the you know, myriad of very sophisticated results on distance are basically philosophically grounded on this. Does that make sense? Okay. So what are we doing? We're changing things to order the noise sequences in decreasing probability, whatever your distribution was. And if you have memory, I'm happy to take into account the memory if you have a Markov channel, whatever it is. Whatever you have, whatever you know about the noise, tell me. I'm not going to do that interleaving that I showed you before, you know, where I'm trying to break up temporal effects in the noise. Tell me everything you know. I will make use of it. I'm going to subtract the noise, check for code with membership. The first yes has to be my maximum likelihood decoding. It leverages the noise statistics, OK? Uh, and this is actually, it's on our card, but it was, it was just accepted to uh, transactions on information. OK, so what does that mean by this? Remember the example we started out with in the beginning of the lecture? It, Eight symbols, the last one was flipped. Of course, if you told me, you know, if it came in red and I knew it was flipped, I would be done. I don't know that, OK? So I first guess the most likely event, which is that nothing happened. And I say, well, you know, I'm just going to subtract that. Um, and I say, is this a code word? No, OK. Uh, that didn't work. And then I start the next one was most likely. And by the way, I'm doing it on purpose to start at the end. In a lot of systems, because of timing issues, I get more errors at the end than at the beginning. Again, this is something I can take into account very easily here. You know, at the beginning, you just had your, your synchronization and your sounding signals, and you know, you're doing great. And you know, it's like it's like the end, it's like your day. You know, by the end of it, it's like, okay. So that's basically what you're taking into account. You know, this is like you know, the, the, whatever the post lunch. All right, so. How does decoding correspond to maximum? How does this uh, guess decoding correspond to maximum likelihood? So I have a channel output plus noise. So this plus with a circle, think of it as like you know binary addition, but it could be you know it could be a discrete memory of this channel. It could be addition over your favorite Galois field, whatever it is. So maximum likelihood decoding is I'm looking at the code word, might like that. Star, it's the best one, which is the art max of this. This is what Shannon told us. This is what Gallagher told us. This is what everybody told us. And we're going to say yes. But that is also this. It's also look at the noise, which has the highest probability. This is what I said before. So I'm just putting in math what I told you before. Everybody happy with that? Same thing. Highest likelihood code word, highest likelihood noise. All right. So what I do when I decode by guessing is I look at the noise that has the highest probability. And that noise which has the highest probability is the one that it corresponds to maximum likelihood decoding. OK, so basically that would be this one. OK. So some number of guesses will eventually identify the true noise. Okay. If I only sent you one code word, 
suppose it was one code word. Well, that's not very difficult to guess. But suppose I didn't know the code book, but there's only one code word in it. And I kept guessing the noise. Eventually, I would guess the correct code, code word. By going to this checker, remember? I look at it, guess the noise, tell the checker, hey, is this a code word or not? And eventually, he says yes. So I would guess the true noise eventually. The thing is that I might hit this code word difference noise that I mentioned before, which is the, the noise that cor this fake noise that corresponds to the difference between the code word that was sent and one of these other randomly sprinkled code words in my code book. So if the code word difference noise is queried before the true noise, that's when I get an error. So I have a race. I have a race between guessing the true noise and guessing the wrong noise, okay? Which is this code word difference noise. So because my code book is randomly uniform, I mentioned that earlier. I told you that was going to be important. The location of this code word difference noise in the guessing order is uniform. Could be anything. Remember, I, I, I do this with replacement, this choice of code words. Yeah? So an error occurs at a guess. So basically, an error occurs at a guess minimum of a 2 to the n or uniforms in 2 to the e. 1 to 2 to the n. That is, those uniforms are the, um, the code word difference noises. Yeah? The uniform distributed. And the actual noise, which is the correct noise. So how long until I get to a code word difference noise? How long until I guess the first code word difference noise? You know, I just start with 0, 0, 0, and I keep guessing. It's going to take me, on average, before I hit the first one, 2 to the n, 1 minus r. Why? Because it's 2 to the n possible things, OK? And I sprinkle 2 to the n r. So it's 2 to the n, OK, over 2 to the n r. That's all I did. First principles, OK? The second year undergraduate could do this. Okay. So the correct output, which is a true noise, what's going to happen is the optimal guessing order, of course, there is you're going to start with the most likely and go down to the least likely. So if z is the noise, um, sorry, um, yeah. if z is the realization of the noise, so the noise is the random variable and z is the realization, g is what's called the guesswork which is the optimal number of queries until I guess something. So the, guess, the notion of guesswork was introduced by Massey in the 90s. Super short paper. OK, like really, just a couple pages. You can read it. And the idea is, for instance, when do you use this? You use this when you're doing something like trying to guess a password. So this is the kind of stuff we had originally looked at for password guessing. How do you guess a password? How do you do password cracking? You start from the most likely and go down to the least, least likely. Okay. So now what? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay, but this is the first time I've done anything bad to you, and we're 45 minutes in. So that's pretty good. Okay. Remember, I told you about Randy entropy of the noise. Randy entropy of the noise, Randy entropy of order alpha, is given by this thing. Okay, and it just so happens that um, in the case where alpha goes to 1, the limit as alpha goes to 1 of this Renyi entropy is the regular plain old Shannon entropy, the one that you, know, you saw in thermo. Okay? It's the limit as alpha goes to 1. And what we know from Arakan, actually, uh, who went and looked at this from some other work, is that um, the limit of the expected of the moments of the guesswork. Remember, the guesswork is how much work I have to do until I guess. That is to say, how many guesses until I guess correctly? Yeah? That's the guesswork. So G is the guesswork. The moments, so you know, alpha would be moment one, you know, uh, alpha one would be the, the mean, alpha two would be the second moment, varies, and so on, okay? It's given by this, which basically means that if I'm looking at the mean, which is the case where alpha is 1. This is 1 h 1 half, which is why I told you is the Renyi entropy of order 1 half. 
Okay? I know it's funny, because if you look, for instance, at NIST, and you look at password, <coughs> entropy requirements from NIST, they give it to you in Shannon entropy. They shouldn't. They should give it to you in Renyi entropy of order one half. And it, by the way, it's a big difference, okay? So it's not a minor thing, but so there's a lot of interesting things on this on passwords. Happy to talk about it offline. Now, what uh, Ken did with his student, Mark Christensen, in 2013, is he showed that from this, you can get a large deviation principle. Now, what is a large deviation principle? A large deviation principle is the following. You take these moments, first moment, second moment, so, you know, mean, variance, kurtosis, blah, blah, blah. And from that, you get an approximation of the distribution, the actual distribution. And the large deviation principle roughly says that if something unlikely happens, only the most likely thing of the, uh, of the, of the, only the most likely thing of the unlikely things happens. Okay? So when bad junk happens that you didn't expect, at least of the things you didn't expect is the one you should have expected. Okay? But it's basically giving you an approximation of the distribution. All right. So at this point, we were excited. And if you look at the average guesses on an error, it's to the end, 1 minus r. We already did that from first principles. The average guesses to the actual noise is 2 to the n h 1 half. Oh, no. Remember, that's the cutoff rate. But how could it be so that I get the cutoff rate? It's a maximum likelihood. So I'm going to take just 30 seconds now so that we can all share the anxiety, the angst, and the <laughs> unhappiness that Ken and I were experiencing when we went, what did we do wrong? <coughs> what did we do wrong? I mean, yes, I know I can, I can decode up to the cutoff rate. No, duh. You know, but, but I should be able to compute to capacity. What am I missing? What am I doing wrong? And this is why you should not only work in the average case. OK? So chop one to the, to the, 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 the perils of mean field analysis. Because that is the actual time until you get to the real noise, but I'm going to get a distribution. And the reason it takes me so ruddy long sometimes to get to the real noise is because I had a really weird, weird, weird noise. And when I have a really, really weird, weird noise, it's never even going to get to that guessing because I'm going to hit first one of the other code words. Okay. It's not that I'm trying to guess that one noise. I may not even get to get that one, guess that one noise. So let me give you a heat map here. So this is Bernoulli noise. So you know, uh, uh, ID bit flips, probably 10% of bit flips. I have a length of 200. Blue means that I have zero. This is a cumulative distribution function, number of guesses per bit in layer. Okay? And basically what you can see here is I have almost no probability, almost no probability goes purple, you know, probably one. Okay? So how many guesses am I doing? Very unlikely I do this few, very unlikely I do this few, boom. Very likely I do fewer than these. Does that make sense? Now one is the Shannon typical set. I haven't told you what the Shannon typical set, but the Shannon typical set is basically the set using, you know, a, a small variation on the weak law of large numbers that you've learned as undergraduates that says that, you know, this is where most of my probability lies of the noise. So the most of the probability of the noise lies over here. But the average guesswork, this is supposed to the probability up until when, you know, this is the, the probability of, of, of getting it wrong anyway because of the other guys, the other noise, the, 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 other, the other code words. Okay? That's my, that's my uh, uh, light, uh, light turquoise here. But the average guesswork is all the way over there because the reason the average guesswork is so long is because of the very unlikely things. Think of a password, right? When I'm guessing a password, very quickly people guess the right password. The cases where it takes them very long is if the password was super unlikely. Okay. So 
do I need to stop? Mm. OK. So basically, the number of guesses until a random length is identified. As I told you, there's a large deviation principle. So I'm looking at this minimum of the uniforms, which is this uh, fake noise, OK, this, uh, this noise here in uh, this um, code word difference noise. And basically, we got over this, this fright. Man, was it a fright. Uh, and you, there's a little bit of a subtlety, but the coding theorem says the probability of error, which is the probability. So what do I do in error? I do an error if the guesswork for the real noise is less than the guesswork for this code word difference noise. We in agreement? That's what an error is. I guess wrong noise. OK? And that probability I can deduce from this large deviation principle. Okay, and this is um, actually taken from some from the LDP work that Mark and Ken had done, and then we had done some work later for multi-user guesswork, where you had this this race among guessing different things. Also in my uh, former student Fabio Pincavon. Get this. Okay, so let me just go over this quickly. Remember how I told you that as the rate goes up, normally in you know, traditional decoding where you're decoding based on the, on the actual code words, it's getting worse and worse. If I'm doing the brute force that I mentioned earlier in the, in the, in the lecture, if I'm doing the brute force, this is the length of the code, 100, 200, so on, and I'm guessing based on the code words, this is my complexity. By the way, the ordinate here is in the log scale. So we're like 10 to the 10, 10 to the 15, just jumps out. Okay, this is the problem. If I'm guessing the noise, I actually don't care how long, how big my rate is. Because I'm guessing the noise. I'm not depending on the code, code rate. Until it gets to the point where it starts becoming likely that rather than guessing the actual noise, I'm going to guess the wrong noise the code word difference noise, in which case my complexity goes down. But you see that my complexity here is either independent of the code rate or going down. Those little lozenges there, these little lozenges here, okay, these correspond actually to um, uh, well, actually, I'm not going to go into We can talk offline with people in the group. But they correspond to something important that people have looked at. So the higher code words require fewer guesses. Okay. And by the way, oh, this is ID bit flips with you know probably ten to the minus three. I'm allowing a block error rate that's a, that's to say for that code book for that for that entire code length, okay, for that code word uh, of 10 to the minus 2. So these, these are very typical type of numbers. And this is where it's bursty. So I have some, I have some uh, time um, dependence, and I'm using that time <coughs> dependence, the statistical knowledge that I have of that time dependence uh, to figure out, okay, what's going on. Uh, how far should I guess, by the way? I should give up. I'll give up on this talk soon, don't worry. But uh, I should give up and abandon guessing after some number if no code word book is identified. And it, you know, because remember how in this heat map, you know, I really just want to be sort of like right around here anyway. That gets me to capacity. Why am I even guessing? And sure, I, I don't need to guess all there, but why am I even guessing beyond this, much beyond that? I already have all probability. I'm already in red. Why am I even doing this? It's just every so often it's going to take me forever. So forget about it. Forget about it. And you're going to say, yeah, but if you forget about it, I'm going to give up some rate. No, I'm still capacity achieving. That's more subtle. I'm not going to go into it. OK. So you can keep doing this. Why does this matter? OK, so this is something where we look at read Miller codes, you know, very established codes. Because remember, our system doesn't care about the code book. It works on any code book. Uh, different rates here, 
0.9375, And here we're using an optimized Reed Mueller decoder that's that's out there. Okay? But uh, okay. And this is work with uh, my uh, student Emmett Salomon, my former postdoc for Kashnaria, and uh, uh, from postdoc uh, Shore Connell, who's you know still affiliated to uh, research scientist in the in the group. So this is grand, and grand with abandonment. This is the block error rate. And one of the nice things about the Reed-Muller code is that it's an approximate maximum likelihood. Almost all decodings are approximate maximum likelihood. And in the particular case that we're choosing here, when we're doing the grand dab, I've actually pulled the abandonment forward enough that it gives me exactly the same thing as Reed-Muller. So you have the exact same block error rate with this particular level of abandonment. Does it make sense? It just, that, it just works out that way. This is the speed up that I get for different signal to noise ratio. So those signal to noise ratio on the physical layer tells you how lucky these bit flips are that I talked about. Okay, so never mind how I map the signal to noise ratio of the bit flips. We, we all, you know, plenty of people know how to do that. Uh, so that's, that's not interesting, but it's the speed up. So you can see the speed up that we get. You can see that having the abandonment helps with the speed up. But you're getting speed up for 50, 100, 150, and so on. So we're building a chip right now. We're designing a chip with Anantha Chandra Kassan and, uh, uh, at MIT, who's our dean, and uh, Rabia Ziegli, um, who is at, um, uh, at BU, uh, former postdoc at MIT. So we're, we're, doing, uh, we're, we're building a chip based on this, a universal chip for any code, OK? Um, to see you know, how it works, so we're doing that. Uh, one of the things I want to mention is you can parallelize this super easily. Right, so guessing these guessing these different uh, these different sequences, you can parallelize. Okay, so I'm not going to go into it, but you can see right away. Well, you know, I could, you know, one guy could be guessing one, where the other one's guessing the other. No harm done. Whoever gets done first, great. Yeah. Uh, the parallelization benefit on top of the uh, you know 50, 100 speed ups that I showed you before, you know, you get another factor of 10 with a number of threads not huge. Okay, so this was done with multi-threading. Right now, of course, we're doing it in hardware. Okay, I'm not going to tell you how to put in soft information, but it's really easy. You get another huge gain, huge, huge gain in complexity. That's it. Um, I'm done with three minutes to go. Okay, thank you. <coughs>